Yes. We are about preparing to go live stream. So, uh, well, when you say link, sorry, go to YouTube and then search now Toronto. We are now streaming live. Okay, got it. Give I me a second here. Let me send it to you. Um, so for there we are, we are okay. We're on live. So just uh, to the Now Magazine followers, this is um, we are now streaming live uh, with the com with a, a community of filmmakers from BIPOC Film and TV. We are okay. We're on live. So just to the Now Magazine followers. I just need to. We are now streaming live uh, with, uh, Sorry. with a, a community of... Sorry, I just needed to mute myself because I was hearing myself come back to me at YouTube. Um, so I might as well just introduce everyone that's already here for the people who are already kind of just... If, if anyone's already going to watching this, this is uh, we got uh, Noel Carbone. Uh, I'll introduce them better when everyone else is there. Noel Carbone, JP LaRock, who are both uh, t uh, television writers, executive producers, Kate on from BIPOC TV and film, Ash from BIPOC TV and film, Ryan Cooper, who is developing his own TV series. That's the quick introductions. We'll wait till everyone gets there. I'm just saying this now because we are streaming live to the now audience. We're also just trying to get things organized. So please bear with us. We're going to hang out here for a little while. Um, and I will now, Ash, can you hear me? Oh, wait, I muted myself. Uh, can you say, sorry, there we go. So do you have the link yet? Yes, I got. I, I'm, I'm on your YouTube. You can see it. You're you're on the so you can see us on YouTube. There we go. Okay. Um. So now, guys, I need to pee. I'll be back. <laughs> and Cooper, who's developing his own TV series. That's the quick introductions. We'll wait until everyone wait, gets what? there. I'm just saying this now. Where am I, we why are am I hearing myself, myself back? Myself. We're also just. Did you? Were you guys hearing oh. me? Come back to me. Yes. <laughs> Is Mercury in retrograde? <laughs> just, just asking that question. That writers understand. <laughs> okay. All right. I don't know how that. I, I don't know how that happened. Okay. I'll be back. Um, actually, uh, is everyone here? So you got your. Do you want to give more people the time to like kind of tune in and stuff? Or yeah, no? oh, I think we should. Yeah, because there's. Uh, I think I think right now there's ten people watching right now. So like, yeah. So just give everyone a second to be with the links. I am going to be right back. Um, just again for the uh, anyone who's uh, if there's anyone following from now magazines followers, we are streaming a live conversation called Meanwhile in Canada about the television business, about discrimination in the Canadian television business, and we are going to be back to have this conversation with these wonderful people. Um, I will be back. All right. Guys. If anyone else wants to take a two minute break, go ahead. Uh, is this the YouTube all the kids are talking about? We, we, yeah. <laughs> the kids are watching us. Technically, we're influencers now. We're influencers, so. Finally. Right on. Finally. <laughs> I don't know, like, it's it's an hour later, so I don't know how many people we have um, missed. Well, I mean, technically, they should they would still be listening to us <laughs> talk. But they'd they be, like, still... taping link to link to link. <laughs> So hopefully they didn't have plans at eight o'clock because we wouldn't have been done talking. <laughs> That's right. If they jump off at nine, I get it. For everyone who's watching uh, or who's now watching, you can head to the event bright page of this particular event to actually get to this live. I've updated the live stream link there, but I just realized everyone's already watching. All right, so let me say who's here, right? Okay, uh, we're not gonna start just yet, I think. But what I was gonna say is, should we also have anyone who wants to, um, like chime in or wants to ask a question, they could actually just uh drop a comment, I think, on the YouTube page. So, uh, Ash, can I chat task you with watching the comments on the YouTube page? Uh, there's like a, there's a chat function on the YouTube page, and then you could just feed them back to me into the Zoom chat. Yes, I can do that. Thank you. Does that work? And I mean, I think all of us can see the Zoom chat, right? Yes. I, and I think we don't have uh, Christopher and Natasha. Oh, shit. Okay. So uh, did they know to come back to the same link? Well, there's Christopher. And there's Natasha. <laughs> So um, I guess we'll just like explain 
what's going on. I'm looking, you know what, let me just once again, set myself up from the other computer. So due to technical difficulties, we are all coming at you live from Now Magazine's YouTube account to have this panel, to have this conversation about, uh, what are we talking about today? Meanwhile, Canada. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> I, I, think, I think I totally forgot what my last role was. Now, 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 now I'm back in. Y'all take the conversation <laughs> over. Thank you, Now Magazine, for letting us take over. <laughs> <laughs> You just totally hijack shit. Yeah. yeah, you hijack the now account. Let me just stop. All right, so Natalie, what do you want to talk about while we're waiting for everyone to come in? Is it, or is that? Do you think that's enough time? Should we just start the start the the roll? I mean, I can just talk about how stressful the past hour has been. <laughs> It's been fun. Anthony's like, it's bedtime. Why the fuck am I still here? <laughs> I, I, wish, like... I wish I slept. <laughs> I was like, bedtime was a, I haven't had bedtime in a while. Oh, yeah. That's all right. So, I guess the exciting thing is that we broke the Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> we broke the Zoom. So, it's for Ralph I mean, broke the internet. Yeah. So once again, everyone who wants to chime in, just chime into the to the YouTube live chat function. Um, and I mean, I guess we should. I mean, it's eight o'clock. Should we just get rolling? And um, and so, who, who? What was the order of things? The order is uh, Ash, who was yes, going to yes. do an intro and land acknowledgement, and then uh, I was going to say a few words, then Kay, and then Kay was going to throw it to you. So let's just jump right in shall we pretend like it's seven yeah we'll pretend like it's seven we're, we're in manitoba yeah, time yeah. you mm -hmm. know how canadian tv is always considered about the prairies is let's fucking let's, let, 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 let's uh we're operating there at schedule um, thank you so much rad for that uh and everyone thank you so much for joining us in on this particular live today uh, we are looking forward to having a great discussion through this live and my name is Ashutosh Sharma, and I am the BIPOC TV and Films Programming and Events Coordinator. Uh, my name is Ash. I'm a settler and currently situated in Takaronto and Turtle Island, and I'm grateful to be working on this land. We acknowledge the land we are broadcasting from is a traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Mithis. We also acknowledge that Takaranto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. These treaties and other agreements, including the One Dish with One Spoon, One Boom Belt Covenant, are agreements to peaceably share, peaceably share and care for the land and its resources. Other indigenous nations, Europeans and newcomers were invited into this covenant in the spirit of respect, peace and friendship. We are mindful of broken covenants and we strive to make this right with the land and with each other. We are all treaty people. Many of us have come here as settlers, immigrants, newcomers, and refugees in this generation or generations past. I would also like to acknowledge those of us who came here forcibly, particularly as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. Therefore, I honor and pay tribute to the ancestors of African origin and descent. We also acknowledge that today is a national day of missing and murdered indigenous girls, women, and two-spirit people. You, our guests on this live, are joining us from different areas, and I would like to invite you to look up the land on which you are situated and educate yourself on its history. Thank you so much. I'd now like to take this opportunity to introduce and invite uh, Natalie Younglai, the founder of BIPOC TV and Film, and Karen Douglas, the executive director of BIPOC TV and Film, to say a few words. Thank you, Ash, and thank you, everyone, for following us on this bit of an adventure tonight from link to link and now i don't even know where we are uh, we're on the now magazine youtube page yes <laughs> thank you now magazine thank you <laughs> um I, I love that you know in the morning maybe rad your your boss will wake up and be like hey what just happened last night <laughs> i think i'm actually going to tweet it right now <laughs> like, yes. you know, just, yes, please be aware this is going down <laughs> Yeah. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, we at BIPOC TV and Film thought that it was important to host 
this really meaningful discussion um, because it is important to build and show solidarity, um, whether it's racism, homophobia, ableism, classism, sizeism, sizeism all are interconnected and are po and points to who has had the power for so long and what needs to change. And this conversation, even though some of it was sparked by BYU TV, a lot of it actually happens here in Canada with Canadian broadcasters, Canadian producers, and in the Canadian TV industry. Uh, it might not be so overt, but it does happen. So it is important that we share our stories because lots of time it's whisper networks, but that is what keeps abusive people and abusive practices in power. So by sharing our stories, we can take back the power. Great, thank you so much. Um, it's, been, <laughs> it's been a wild ride this evening. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, I'm Kiran Douglas, Executive Director for BIPOC TV and Film. I just like to pick up for what Natalie said. Um, in preparation for this panel, I've been really thinking about the emotional toll of racism and discrimination on our creators, on our community, on BIPOC, on BIPOC individuals, and went back to a line from Audre Lorde where she said, and when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard, nor welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid, so it is better to speak remembering we were never meant to survive. And in this current system, in the system that we live in, we are not meant to survive. So what do we do? What should we do? We speak, we break our silence to heal ourselves. We break our silence to liberate ourselves from these systems so that we could contribute to we could contribute to our society and to our world in a meaningful way. So thank you so much for all of the people who are stepping forward today to share their, share their truth and to speak truth to power in terms of what is happening within Canadian TV. Thank you all so much for being here. Is it my turn? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, were you going to oh, yes. hand off? Are you going to yes. let me know? Or oh, like... Yes. Oh my, you see, I'm so frazzled now because we're moving <laughs> Yes. Like... Um, I would love to introduce our incredible moderator for this evening and the superhero of tonight, um, Rad of Film. His name is Rad, and he is Rad, <laughs> um, film critic, film critic, and culture and culture editor. Um, so thank you so much, Rad. And Rad will introduce our panelists. I love that you're you're introducing me on the now tip page. I should be introducing y'all. By the way, again, <laughs> once again, now followers, this is the BIPOC Film and TV panel on called Meanwhile in Canada. Thank you, Natalie and Caden, uh, for inviting me. Caden for inviting me to to, to host this. Um, and I'm just going to jump right into it because we. I mean, I think people have been waiting an hour now to get into this conversation. So let me just bing bang boom introduce everyone here. So. Uh, let's start off with, I mean, dude, that kind of, I mean, uh, you know, Anthony, Anthony Q. Farrell, who is a, a, a showrunner, screenwriter. He's uh, written for The Office and he's also written, wait, wait, and then I, I had a whole thing planned out, it, written for The Office, written for The Thundermans. We're here tonight because of uh, conversations we had with Anthony about the shows he's currently writing called The Parker Andersons and Amelia Parker show running uh, and uh, an upcoming show called Overlords and the, Under and the Underwoods for BYU TV. Say hello, Anthony. Hello. <laughs> yeah, you're doing. Um, okay, so up next we got let's see, uh, JP LaRock, uh, who is a writer for Jan and Diggs Town and Another Life, and also an arts journalist, by the way, because he wants to steal my work. Um, say hi, Jay. I'm a big admirer of your work on Twitter, JP. Say hello. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming. And then we also got Noel Carbone, who is an executive producer on Wyona Earp and Cor and Coroner. Why, why are people turning off their cameras, by the way? <laughs> okay. Well, oh, okay. You, all right, that's cool. That's cool. Okay. And then we also got um, Ryan. Oh, yeah. I forgot. Sorry. I'm sorry, Ash and, and Natalie, for calling you out there and Caden. I just, I totally forgot that you guys were not part of this panel because I just got used to this being the vibe. Ryan Cooper. Uh, uh, Ryan Cooper is a de develop. He's developing. Yeah, sorry. He's a writer, uh, a filmmaker. He's currently developing. Uh, well, sorry, Ryan. My notes are all getting lost on me. He, he has show. Uh, now you got to remind me because it's like I'm so lost. You may break people. So and many shows. Yeah, no, no, no. But you may <laughs> break people and digit threats. And you're currently developing a series on conversion therapy called Alter Boys. Am I right? Yeah. And then you also we wanted we want, we had to mention this something about a Sasquatch. Oh, my sister Sasquatch, I'm developing an animated series with CBC, among other 
projects with other broadcasters. So yeah, I'll just, you can just leave it there. All right, cool. And then finally, we got Natasha uh, Cecily. Is it Cecily? It's uh, Natasha Cecily Bacchus, who is an athlete, an artist, and also uh, starring in, in Bayer, which you might uh, know from the 21 Black Future series uh, hosted by CBC and the Obsidian Theater. Um, and uh, yeah, no, I'm welcome. Thank you for being here, Natasha. You're very welcome. <laughs> Thanks. All right, so uh, let's let's take it back to uh, you, Anthony. Um, so this conversation, I mean, the, the reason we're having this panel, it's called Meanwhile in Canada. We're having this panel because of the conversations we were having about BYU TV, about the programs there. But of course, this is not an issue that is limited to BYU TV. I think it's just an interesting exemplary example of something that you know we 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 noticed it in BYU TV, but this is happening all over Canada. But let let's start there. Now you were working we were working on a series, uh, or sorry, you were you made the series Amelia Parker and Parker Andersons at BYU TV. You're currently developing Overlord in the Underwoods. The BYU TV, of course, is the 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 broadcasting arm of Brigham Young University, which is the college uh, funded by the Church of Latter Day Saints. And you know, being a religious organization, you know they have uh, they have uh, I guess, restrictions against homosexuality. I'm trying to find the lightest way to say this, but, or whatnot. Um, but, um, uh, and then that, that kind of tinkered down uh, into, into your writing on the show, right? Like uh, not a written rule, but you know, uh, it was sort of like, it, it, it was hinted at, it was, it was spoken in so many words, uh, but BYU TV now after, after the, the, after the two articles, whatnot, they came back and they said they are going to introduce clearly identified uh, queer characters on your upcoming series, Overlords and the Underwoods. Can you can you walk us through what what is going on there? Yeah, I mean, I will say that it's one of those things where I'm really impressed with their ability to. Uh, they've been listening. I mean, we've been having these conversations with because the thing with Overlord, with Parker Anderson's was a show that was mainly done by BYU TV. With Overlord that we're we're shooting right now, um, that has three main broadcasters attached to it. It's BYU, it's CBC, and it's Nickelodeon. So there's a lot going on, just even without the corporate, there's a lot going on for all the different broadcasters because they all kind of want a slightly different show. So that's a different fun challenge in itself. But one of the things that we talked about was having real authentic representation. So we, we've we been having those discussions. We've been, it's, we've got like, I think we've got some great solutions that I'm very excited about. Uh, that don't feel forced or it just feels like it's, you know, it's real and it's authentic and it's just part of our already, it's a very ridiculous show. The show is, a, it's about an alien who is the second worst villain in the entire universe. And then he's in witness protection with a family on earth. So it's a ridiculous comedy that's very funny and very silly. And it's just a matter of like making sure that the world feels real. So that's what we're doing. And I feel really, really good about where we're going. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, so then I'm going to take it over back to go over to JP. Like JP, you were one of the first people to speak out about this. Um, this this new commitment from BYU TV. I mean, it's heartening, but is it enough? Like, it, I mean, because of course, again, we're talking about something that is that is uh, endemic to the entire industry, not just in the U.S. but also in Canada. Yeah. I mean, like obviously, I, I think it is something like this particular issue. I think exposed a larger issue within our industry, which is that oftentimes there's this view that like an incremental approach to representation is the way to go where it's kind of like, we're gonna benefit one group and like, that's enough. And like, eventually we'll get to another group and eventually we'll get to another group. And I think what this particular situation exposed is that when that happens, there are lots of people who end up falling kind of in the cracks who don't end up getting represented, whether that's intersectional identities, kind of stuff like that, like the individuals like that. Um, I mean, I obviously, I. I appreciate Anthony in his position kind of being open about it and speaking about it because there were a lot of other production companies and producers and individuals who were also working alongside who didn't say anything and there was all sorts of you know I think to Natalie's earlier point there are lots of these kind of closed door conversations that happen within the industry in general that are never no one ever shines a light on um, so I mean I'm, I'm optimistic by the BYU statement. I'm optimistic by, you know, Marvel Media, CBC, everyone who spoke up and said that they want to they take steps forward for LGBTQ plus representation. Um, I think it's going to require vigilance. And I think it's going to require like 
keeping an eye on that representation, being vocal, uh, being involved, ensuring that staffing is happening behind the scenes, um, you know, that, that there are the voices in front of the camera and behind the camera as well. Well, so, I mean, one thing I want to, I mean, you know, like I, I, maybe Noel, like I'll bring you in on this conversation too, right? Because it's like, like, I mean, you, you've been part of this industry a long time, you know how this industry works. And I guess one question is like, like, I know we, we might look at like, how do we, how do we, how do we control this? Like, right. How do we, how do we look at not just the BYU TV, but a hallmark and like all these people who have these unspoken rules and stuff, right. And who are backed by these religious organizations. Is this something that we could even go to our Canadian media producers associations and stuff and, or to the CBCs and have written rules to combat unwritten rules? I know big question. Like I, I saved the big question. Uh, who? Um, it's an interesting question. And I think there are no, like when you tell someone who doesn't work in our industry, what happens in our industry, they are like people who have like what civilian jobs, they are shocked and appalled by what is by the, what is said to us, how people are being gate kept. Um, and there is no HR. Like if, if, I've, you know, been in situations. Uh, I mean, I just we should say that as though I am queer as a as a white person, I have a ton of privilege that I carry with me into every room I'm in. So I think that my experiences, the while many of them were um, terrible, I wasn't held back um, because of my otherness. Um, but I've been in rooms where as someone who considers themselves an ally and wants to be, is constantly looking for ways to be better at that and advocate for people who have less privilege than I do, um, having been in this industry for 12 years, like I don't, I don't know where to go when I see something that's, that's not, it's one thing if you know a broadcaster says to the showrunner, we don't want any queer representation and so then Anthony makes that public, you know, in his interview with now, and then everybody on social media comes and there's a reckoning, but I've yet to see the reckoning happen from within. Every time change has been made, it's been because someone came forward, someone in a vulnerable position came forward and said, this is the thing I experienced, or this is the thing that was said to me that goes against the charter, that goes against how anybody should be treated in any workplace. And then there's a groundswell of voices of people outside that experience on social media saying, or outside that room or outside that show saying, this is a completely unacceptable where I'm at. And I think a lot of people in my position um, are at is like, what's the, what's the internal process by which we make change? And I don't have, unfortunately, I don't have <laughs> the answer for that. I would, I would love it if there, if we could go to you know the the producers union or the writers guild or you know but unless it's like i was fired for being queer or i was you know if it's a if it's an actionable by their standards um type of bigotry or discrimination then everyone knows what to do in that case but you're still asking the people who are the most vulnerable people in the room to be the rabble rousers to be the ones who step forward to put themselves in a position where they're going to someone at a union or at a guild to say i've been discriminated against and and that's career ending in a lot of cases so i mean i'm open to suggestions for what can be done internally well, I mean, I want to hear actually, like, let, let, let's speak about some of these experiences. Like, I, I mean, Ryan, you know, you, you, you're developing projects. What is it like to get your voice heard? What are your, well, like, you know, you, you have multiple projects on the go. I mean, and, and, and what are the frustrations you're bumping up against when you're doing, when you're, when you're developing these? Um, well, I mean, being Indigenous, my perspective is always told, uh, being told that it's too, Indigenous or sometimes it's like, can you make it clear for somebody who's not Indigenous? I get that a lot as a two-spirited person. I get asked, well, what is two-spirited? And I'm like, wow, I like, it's it's different for every single one of us. Uh, in a little, in a little bit, so I don't speak on anybody else's behalf in terms of what being Indigenous and two-spirited is. I only can speak from my perspective. And I guess that's been an interesting 
conversation usually, but like, like I said, I'm developing a show with CB Street now, but I, I you know, a non-binary Sasquatch from the non-colonial world in my, in my story. And this Sasquatch comes into this world and is like, well, why is everybody like divided? Why are there all these fractions of people? And I, 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 they really pushed me to like go into that kind of like perspective. Also, if anybody ever told me that there was something wrong with my, my idea as a two-spirited person, like I don't mind walking. I don't care who you are. <laughs> like I, I, care, I care way too much about my community and my people and my two-spirited identity and other people that need to see themselves on TV. There hasn't been a two-spirited person on TV. Actually, I'll take that back. There was a person on TV that was two-spirited that died in the first 10 minutes, a horrible fucking death. And that was devastating for me to watch that. Um, but like I said, I the problems that I run into, I make people listen to me in terms of my identity because the lack and just the pure neglect that they had for people who are from different minorities and communities, like that's your all fault. Like that's like you are causing all of this uproar within this in all our communities because you've neglected us. So I don't mind being that person saying that shit to everybody. Mm. Well, I mean, uh, I'm wondering, yeah, I mean, uh, sorry, like I'm thinking back to what Noel said. It's like, the, like, you know, it's on always on the marginalized people to be the rabble rousers and stuff and, and stuff. It's like, and I mean, I've, I think I've said this on other panels. It's like, it's, it's great. It's for, I mean, it, it's up to these marginalized people to put their voices out there. But then, and and then by doing so, they're paving the way and they're uplifting others. But by them putting themselves out there and saying it, they're the ones that end up getting punished. Like they're the ones that get singled out while everyone else can benefit from their sacrifice, right? So it's, it's hard to put that on people, right? I don't know, like we have each other's back. So is that going to be an issue anymore if we're all standing together? Even though one person's using their voice, everybody can just put their hands on each other's shoulders and amplify, right? Like yeah. we have to. And that's like what's gonna make these systems change um like look what happened with anthony's show like look at all the people that put their hands on each other's shoulder and use each other's voice it amplified and now they change their their whole like at least to some extent change what they wanted that they said they weren't going to do and now they're even created an apology that apology i don't know is like if it's real or not, but at least they did it. Like, and now they have no choice. Like, I feel like the spotlight's on them, right? Like, mm -hmm. like well, don't, <laughs> yeah. Um, let's, uh, Natasha, let's bring you in here. Like, I mean, you're, 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 you're creating your own content, right? I mean, you're creating, again, I see you, uh, your stuff on YouTube and stuff and, and you get this opportunity to, to, to act on in this 21 Futures project. But well, what's it been like for you to try to tell your stories that represent your community uh, on Canadian screens, because I'm sure I'm not seeing much of it. Yeah, awesome. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> I grew up, to be honest, I was, uh, I was a track runner for a long time. I was in track and field. I was, uh, I was twice in the Deaf Olympics. And uh, in, it wasn't until, 20, until 2019 I met some people in the deaf community who actually shared a similar interest in theater. That's how I got into theater um, for the first time. So for me to get involved as a Black actor and across Canada, there's no mentorship, there's no opportunities, there's no Black theaters, especially for, like, for deaf Black folks. So like, it was kind of hard to want to become an actor even to begin with, to penetrate the industry in the first place because you don't see much representation like me and when you look around the minority is also just hearing people alone right like I mean that's a vast majority and then from there you take the deaf community which is already a minority and then a minority of that is the deaf artist so you got to step into it and like me representing like you when I was in track and field a lot of people got to see me do that but being an artist as well, there's a lot of ways to empower the other people that are around us that want to have those same opportunities. And now that we're in a digital space, we can move that not only in our own regions, but we can do it across Canada as well. It's pretty easy to, pretty easy to do that, spread your word on uh, digital opportunities. And, um, and on... Uh, also, I've been doing some, uh, creating some digital content with uh, CBC as well, and trying to get 
uh, and what we did is we got six black artists who I know personally, all of them, and to recognize all of their artwork and to for them to be representatives and to get more people to be in this community. So, uh, in so the important thing is though is like the audience is in front of us and what the impact is on the audiences that are that are in front of us and. For some people from, for example, out of town, who are any from Toronto, come into Toronto, it's a much more diverse art scene, which is pretty amazing. But as well, it's about giving people and giving the deaf community uh, access and uh, providing interpreters for people to be able to get into the art. That's also a really important thing. Even just tonight, you guys providing an interpreter was really great. So uh, it's an important thing as well is, is access, which of course is not going to be 100% perfect. But it's important to uh, it's important to recognize our communities to look back and make sure that we're bringing other people up because if we want to identify people that have privilege and so on, where we sit in the middle of that is being able to bring people up to what the privilege we do have as well. So it's about uh, encouraging other people and it's about training and practicing. And because I grew up as an athlete, becoming an artist, I have that um, I have that. Uh, um ability because i've trained as an artist in that perseverance <clears throat> now i just uh first of all i want to say that uh to people watching if you do have any kind of comments or questions please drop them into the chat box on the youtube page um and y'all in the panel if there's anything you want to jump in and say something uh you know just signal me or just interrupt me again a reminder um one thing i wanted to bring up uh christopher tell me am i is there something she wants to uh, add Natasha, want to add something? Is it just me? Like, I can't, I can't hear anybody right now. Oh, uh, Christopher, you can't hear anything, or Natasha can't hear anything. No, wait, we, we, sorry, Christopher, you can't hear it. Um, so I'm going to get Caden to communicate with Christopher on that front, and I'm just going to uh, throw, throw this back out to the group. So first of all, I mean, there's a few uh, questions or, or uh, questions about like where people want. Um, oh, audio is disconnected for my hands. Um, okay, Caden and sorry, we're just having a technical issue on that. And can you all take care of that part? I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to uh, bring up a couple of user comments just for clarification. We got Steph uh, Oak9 asking, uh, can we can we clarify who the first broadcaster was on Overlord? Uh, yeah, it was Hulu. Then they dropped out. Oh, because is, they had, is this Steph hinting at a bigger story that I should be digging into? <laughs> about, I don't know. Um, no, I mean, this is what happens. Like you, you sell a show sometimes and it's just one of those things where it's like, we sold it to Hulu initially. They were down and uh, uh, they um, got bought by Disney, like literally like two or three months after they bought it. And then they were like, um, oh, sorry. We don't know what we want to do with TV shows anymore. And I was like, cool, 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 cool. So that didn't work out. And then we had CBC and Nickelodeon and ITV on board. And then we were looking for an American broadcaster and Marvel already had a relationship with them. And uh, they eventually came on after uh, a little while. Yeah, that and was, I think that that's- order operations. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think we need to address that too, right? Like, I mean, it's like, like I, mean, I mean, I guess the struggle to hold certain companies to account um, uh, the struggle to hold certain companies to account is so hard when when the Canadian landscape is so spare. Like, I mean, in terms of like where where it would, to get the money, get the get people to back up the projects, is so difficult, right? Like, I think that's uh, that's where some yeah. of the fear comes in, right? I mean, like I've been told before, like I've been told by other broadcasters, like, hey, listen, as soon as you have an American broadcaster, we're we're in. Let mm -hmm. us know when you have an American broadcaster on that show. I'm like, you don't want to you don't want to be on top of you don't want to be in it until there's an American broadcast because it's money, right? Like everyone, like there's just not, if you want to make the show and make it a certain way, unfortunately people are going to have to go to different places to, uh, to get the cash to make, to make those shows. There's just not, you know, we were looking at some of the numbers, just there's not a lot of show. There's not a lot of people who are doing, who are not doing Copros. And that's not just a Canadian thing. That's, that's UK. That's, that's, you know, Australia. There's just people that there's a reason why these, these uh, TV conferences are so packed. It's like, 
there are people from all around the world trying to find partners to make shows so they can have so they can have enough money to make make uh you know just a, a tv show in their in their little part of the world so america's the only one really with the uh, money to be like oh we're just gonna make a show and whatever happens happens that's yeah. the only place that i know right now that's kind of doing that and that's the thing it's never safe when you're dealing with americans right and if you're dealing with like something something associated with a trump or a fox or something like that it's like uh, i mean installing kind of safeguards is always going to be tricky right um what you know As one thing i want to take offense sir Sorry? <laughs> oh, so, yeah. uh, one thing I wanted to get into though, or like, I mean, that maybe we didn't touch on is like, because the BYU, y'all ignore my daughter's bedroom. <laughs> um, the best. Uh, see, I'm getting too relaxed and I just dip my, okay. So the BYU TV thing, um, I think it touched, but it, it touches a nerve because I mean, I'm, and I don't know if that like all of our readers uh, appreciate this and, and it's because it's too easy for us to silo each other off. Like, oh, I'm a person of color. I'm black. I'm indigenous. I'm a person of color. I'm queer, like all that stuff. Right. And we don't always necessarily understand each other's experiences. And I think I wanted to kind of underline why um, the BYU TV situation was uh, especially her, hurtful because I and and feel free anyone here to chime in on this. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna ask one individual question, but I mean to have to have a religious organization tell writers to exclude you. Um, I feel like that does hit close to home to your experience, like uh, like to your own experience as a queer person, because that's for a lot of queer people that's that's their experience at home. Their parents were told to exclude them by a church or something like that, right? Is that uh, am I is, is that what what what, what um, I guess makes the pain even more, I don't, I don't know, like intimate, more felt? Anyone? I mean, I think like for me personally, I think what was really interesting about it is that like, again, to kind of some of the stuff that's been discussed, it's like within the industry, we hear all sorts of forms of discrimination that are very, very covert, right? Like they're like small things that are said in passing. Oh, we can't cast this individual as a lead. <laughs> oh, you know, do you have anything else that's maybe, you know, <laughs> less queer? Do you have like, you know what I mean? You get these kinds of like, again, indirect forms of discrimination. And I think what was really like surprising about this particular situation was that it was like, it was an edict that was being issued kind of straight up. Like, you know, like no, no coffee, no alcohol and no, queer characters or storylines, right? And it's like, at that point in time, I mean, it, it is something that you can actually point to as an example of discrimination in the industry that's kind of more clear cut versus some of those other circumstances that are that are quieter. And I mean, obviously like, you know, it, it is, it is, it, it does tap into trauma. It does tap into, you know, the fact that for some people ideologically queer people shouldn't exist and by eliminating them in representation then they eliminate them kind of in a large scale they eliminate acceptance within society um so yeah i do i do think that that resonates um on that front as well mm -hmm. um well i mean let, let's talk about i mean because the only reason like when you say it was so clear cut it's like well it's like we knew to ask those questions because it's called byu tv we know the affiliations we ask those questions we don't ask those questions of other organizations right like we didn't necessarily ask those questions of, of hallmark before we found like you know all that that whole tv commercial situation happened with hallmark right um, I, I mean, I, and I want to hear some of your experiences in terms of the coded language, right? Like Anthony, I mean, it wasn't even that, like, I mean, there's a lot of, the, our audience might find this polarizing, right? Like that's the, that's the language they typically use or. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to, yeah, pull, I think polarizing, I think a lot of their audience wouldn't, they're afraid that a lot of their audience wouldn't understand, but I think not just BYU, but also like, you know, just having worked for many broadcasters over the years i feel like there's a lot of times that just people kind of like quietly kind of be like oh you know what can we not do that now because our we're doing that another show and then and what was who was it just recently who was like oh the um the whole thing with uh parma when she was like oh they didn't they already had an indian actor so they you know they they didn't want to include her like stuff like that happens it's rampant it's just kind of like you, you see the tokenism everywhere so it's just one of those things where it's like i'm glad we're having these discussions because people need to hear these things out loud and it's one of the things that i always tell writers i'm like you you can't fix things till you say something like we we don't 
And you also, you don't realize that the problem is not just your problem. It's not something that you're dealing with alone. Like we're all dealing with this at all these different levels, but until you actually speak up and say something, you, you don't realize how big these problems are. So I'm just glad we're talking about this stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I, and I want to hear like, so I, I mean, Noel, tell me, like, I mean, what, 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 are, what are the ways they kind of dress up the language sometimes? I mean, you, yeah, you know, for, and first of all, has it even gotten any better from, 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 from some of your earlier work to, to, to uh, Wyona Earp and Coroner, right? Like, but I, I like, 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 I just, I, I just want to hear the creative ways where they dress up their, the kind of the biases and, and the, the way they dress and the way they discriminate. I mean, I'll say that working on Winona and working on Coroner are two, are two examples of great shows where we have the conversations, the hard conversations, and we don't shy away from certainly queer representation. The, those, we just, nobody working on those shows is gatekeeping that stuff. So that is progress, but it just, it may also be that I'm on, I have the privilege of working on two shows with two showrunners who prioritize representation in that way. I will say like, when I, st when I, st when I started as an elder in the industry, um, now like 12 years ago when I started, it was sort of the heyday of like big US broadcasters first investing in Canadian television, like doing co-productions, shows that they aired in the summer. It started with Flashpoint, um, then with Rookie Blue and then other shows. And there was money. There were bigger rooms, there were more episodes, there were more opportunities for new writers to like get the experience they needed to move up in the ranks. But in those six or seven years where that was really taking off, I don't think I worked with a single BIPOC writer in any of those rooms. I worked for one season on one show with, a, with another queer writer, but for the most part, I was the only queer person in the room. And, there, and like I said, there were no BIPOC writers. So that's a generation, that's like a generation of, of QT BIPOC writers who didn't get the experience I got, who didn't get the mentoring I got, who didn't get the, didn't make the connections with broadcasters and studio execs and network execs that I got. And I think, so now, like, I think, well, I will say, I think there are showrunners and producers who worked on those shows, who look back on their legacy and they're kind they're horrified by that and so now they're actively advocating for meaningful representation and meaningful change and looking for ways to be better allies not all of them mind you there are there are many who still don't get it but many who do and are here i think listening and i will say like now the excuse is there's no money but the money is always because the money is always the thing that everybody obsesses over it's a great way to divide communities it's a great way to go you know we don't have the money to bring in this actor who he for some reason hired at the beginning of the run of the show it seemed feasible to have to fly them in from Vancouver to be on the show but now we have to cut you know the budgets are, are shrinking so you know it's time to let some people go from this big sprawling ensemble. And then you look back and you're like, okay, so all the black people are gone now. Like, and, and that's not, no one's going, let's get rid of the black people, but all the, all the white people at the top of the food chain are doing it without realizing it. And then when you get into like the writing, it's like, I mean, I wish that they, I wish that some people were using coded language. You know, I had, um, someone share an experience with me where a network executive um, sent an email, put it in writing. We all, this character doesn't need to be black. We've already had black stories. How about you cast this white actor instead who we really like? And so who, what do you, I guess, what do you do? Like if you're, if you're a showrunner who gets it and you wanna be part of the change, you go, we're not doing that this writer wanted to tell this story. So we're telling this story with the, and this is what the people who are part of the story look like. And that's not up for debate, but a lot of people will say, who cares? We got the story past the network. All they want is for us to make this person white. Like that's a small price to pay 
for not having to spend days and days and days of rebreaking an episode and rewriting an episode and then we're behind and then that's money and then we're prepping off an outline and we're not you know ahead of the game and so the there are concessions <laughs> there are concessions being made all the time largely to do with money but for the most part it's not it's it has to be everyone's job to police this and to be vigilant like jp was saying before but my but my question is again like if i'm a junior and i'm on that email chain it's my script say and i'm getting my first co-write or i'm getting my first script and my showrunner and the eps on the show aren't going that's completely unacceptable what do i do mm -hmm. yeah i don't know it's a good question <laughs> I think yeah. I would walk. Simple question for me. I like, I don't got no time for racism or any bigotry or any of that bullshit. Like, I lived with that for a large portion of my life because I grew up Christian and hated myself because I was Indigenous and because I was two spirited. Like, fuck anybody else's perception of me or a negative of that. Like, fuck it. I don't need your negativity in my life. I am a strong, independent, indigenous, two-spirited creator, and I don't got no time for that. Like, I will tell you to your face that you are an asshole. <laughs> like, there's no problem with me doing that. I fought to get where I am right now. I work my ass off harder than anybody that I know to get these shows into development. I don't know if I'll ever get anything into production, but that doesn't matter because for me, I brought in so many people into my writer's rooms that were from diverse communities, even if they weren't from mine, but they were great storytellers because I needed to give them their credit. I didn't, I, some, I did even pay myself for some of the rooms that I work with, some of the writing that I did. I don't give a shit about that. We're in the time of reckoning right now for the people who are BIPOC and queer and from minorities. Like y'all have to do your part. Like, like, I just, I just, I have no time. We have to fight. Like, we just have to argue and tell them that they're being wrong and that we just have to band together because if we do, then there's, they, they won't be able to stop us. Like, like I, I just, I, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I, 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 I'm, the, I'm in the same boat as you, Ryan, but I know a lot of writers aren't. Like, I, I'm, even when I was like, there's a, a show I was on, I, I can, I mean, it's not, I was on Thunderbirds for Nickelodeon and there was one time when we were casting a, an actor in my, in one of my episodes and she, and the, the character was gonna be Korean and I asked for the audition to be without an accent. And because it was, because it was funnier, they, the show runners decided to go with the, the person doing that. And, and the, Helen Hong, who, who played Mrs. Wong, she is excellent and she was playing her mom and she was, but when they did that, I wasn't in a place where I was like, I can quit this job. I was in a place where I was like, I just bought a house. I got kids. I'm, I've spoken my piece, but I can't, I can't leave over, over Mrs. Wong having an accent, especially when Helen's like, oh, I'm just playing my mom, it's okay. Like I was like, I can't, I can't just go. But I think what has to happen is, at least for people in Canada now, you've got, we've got to create these, maybe like a mentorship thing. Like, come talk to me, I will fight for you because I don't mind yelling at people about shit like this because it just needs to it needs to stop yeah i want to actually add something i mean first of all i mean I, I, you're right like i mean not everyone can make these 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 hard stances right like uh you know, we've got to eat whatever i mean but but i mean one thing i want to address somebody in the in the comments sasha burzma is talking about how there are contracts floating around where the person has to confirm they don't have a disability that will impact their job um, does anyone of you, Natasha, are you aware of this, uh, this kind of like uh, these kinds of contracts in the industry or does Anthony, Noel, JP, any of you, you seen that kind of stuff? Well, yeah, for sure. So, um, to be completely honest with you, I believe it. Um, and I've seen people like obviously discriminate against people because they're deaf and even in, um, even in movies and TV now, like you're not seeing many deaf actors that are actually deaf folks is a thing. So uh, a lot of those, a lot of those roles for artists, for deaf black artists are, you're not seeing them uh, represented. And it's a really, um, it's a big problem and it's a big frustration for those artists to be able to get 
uh, any opportunities at all. So, um, but as a black deaf queer woman, there's so many things that happen, but there's a lot of things that just don't surprise me anymore. You know what I mean? Like as much as you, as much as you fight for things and so on, it's like, there's a lot of things that are just common and it's exhausting to put up that fight all the time. So, and you know, with disabilities, like you'd be surprised how much people with disabilities can amaze you because they can do anything, but you got to be creative with your mind, creative with your heart and uh, hire more uh, disabled, deaf and disabled actors for sure. Yeah. Now, uh, and I want to add a, no, sorry, another thing like Becca Granier just pointed this out. Um, you know, like what about new writers who, you know, if they spoke up, they might be sacrificing their first credit. And I mean, ba basically you shouldn't be on people to be speaking up, I guess, right? Like we need to have better systems in place, but like, yeah, in terms of that first credit thing, I think that speaks directly to the, to Anthony, your show, right? It's like your show, you gave Alicia and Kelly their first episodic television experience, right? No other, I mean, it's like, yes, we're in this context where we're talking about this discrimination, but at the same time, you're the one that got them in the door, got their experience and their voices get out there. And I think that's that's the question, I guess, th that's the challenge. It's like, do we cut these kinds of organizations off or is the better tactic to slip in there and start, start nudging this kind of change? Um, I don't really have an answer to that, but it's like, but I mean, uh, Noel, JP, all of you, like, how do we do better to make sure we can get people like Alicia Kelly in the door and then affect more change like that? I mean, <laughs> and then, it's, you know, you know, and to give a you big more, question. <laughs> it's a hard, it's a, it, it, sorry, I, go ahead. I, I have an answer for it actually though, which go is ahead. one of the things that I want to do is what I'm doing right with my writers right now. So I'm trying to create more BIPOC more QT BIPOC showrunners because that's that's the only way you're going to get things really changing. If we keep on giving the same people shows, like why like why would you expect things to change if you're not changing things? If you're not, so that's one of the things that I'm trying to get done is I'm trying to get my writers to be at a place where they can they can they can have their own shows, and all of a sudden there are more people hiring more people that you know that. Are looking for these chances so that that i think is one way to try and move things forward and i think i think it's slowly happening i'm seeing it happen with you know some of my writers getting opportunities like that now with with development and and you know eventually some some you know some series and stuff like that so that's that's one way i think we're we're gonna it's gonna take time obviously but this is this is what we got to do to that point, I also think too that it requires diversifying the funders. <laughs> it requires diversifying the networks. It requires like on all levels of the industry, right? So mm -hmm. that like it's, you know, there are, when we speak about gatekeepers, it's like people who fully understand the need for inclusion and for this storytelling and who are not looking to like tokenize, are not looking to just check a box, but people who are actually like, no, I, we want a form of television that's representative of the way we look, <laughs> like, the, the, like the country we look. Um, yeah. Can I, I just wanna, so Christopher and Natalie have to get, sorry, uh, and Natasha have to get going. So I wanna give you just some, like, I mean, get you, get, get you in here. Is there anything that you wanna, I'm not even gonna pose a question and limit to what you wanna say. What do you wanna say before you have to run? Natasha, is that what the oh, message okay. you got? No, just just Chris, just the interpreter. I gotta go. Oh, okay. So then, That's does all, Natasha yeah. want to tell the group anything, yeah. or does have anything to say before you go? Good. Uh, yeah, for sure. So, uh, just the last thing is, thank you so much for having me. Sorry about all the tech issues and so on. But honestly, I appreciate being invited to things like this and inviting more people like me, which is really. Uh, which is really cool. I know a lot of great deaf, uh, deaf artists, deaf BIPOC artists. If anybody's ever interested in looking for more people, let me know. Um, and uh, yeah, it's important in TV and theater just to have more people and to just tell your truth. And we all have that shared responsibility. We all work together. I think we'll be okay. So thank you so much. And thanks for having me. Thank Good night, everybody. Um, well, so now, but, but like uh, I mean, picking up from the last point, then what I wanted to say is like, like, you know, we're talking about how people need to be able to speak up. Right. Like and, and but it's like, uh, I mean, again, we don't want to put that pressure on people to fight back. Where does a union come in on this? Where's our protections there? Like if you're noticing discriminatory behavior, is that not somewhere we can go to? Well, you know, I, I started off as um, 
a second assistant director and an APC assistant production coordinator. I was terrified to go to the union to tell them that I was facing discriminatory actions. Like I got told that I was in my natural habitat in the bush because I'm indigenous. I got a staple remover thrown at me from my boss because I didn't put gas in the car that had over three and a half quarters of gas in it. Like there were just like, I got told that like, I'm lucky because I don't pay for tax or like an, I'm an asshole because I don't have to pay for taxes because I'm indigenous. Like there are all things that I get told from, from so many people that have no idea of what it is to be indigenous. First of all, I pay taxes. Like that is just not true. Like the only place I don't pay taxes on is reserve and I have nothing there. My house had, when I was a kid, I had sewage on my floor with, with holes in my floor with no heat in my house. And people were like, oh, you have your own house. I'm like, girl. Anyways, um, so like at the workplace, I was terrified to go to the unions and the guilds because like, if I go to them who are whites, like, will they protect me or will they just slide it under the rug? Like, I don't know. I was the only person of color usually in all of those, all of those productions. <laughs> so yeah. it was, I don't know. Maybe it's changing now. I feel like it is because of, you know, the amazing person like Warren and, you know, and Tracy Deer and all of these amazing people in other unions across Canada, like Justina Neepin is a part of the BIPOC in Winnipeg. So I feel like there's change happening. Would I still go to a union be if something happened to me? Absolutely not. That's, yeah, and that's, that's the problem, right? Like, I feel like people, the whole point of these unions are supposed to be like, they're supposed to be protecting the people that are paying their their bills like why if that's how that's and that's one i mean i'm i'm in too many unions and I, so i <laughs> i'm in union i'm in wgc dgc actra wga uh sag i'm i'm an awful there's too many people who are afraid to go to the unions to, to complain or to, to say things because they're afraid it's gonna late that's gonna get they're gonna get labeled like the whole point of the union is to protect the people that are in the union so i feel like it's one, it's, there's a disconnect there that we got to figure out. And I think it's, again, just speaking out, saying things like what Ryan's saying, like, I was afraid to go to my union. That's, that's messed up. Well, Natalie is here in, in the comments, is like, yeah, well, you got unions and guilds who do, who have staff that believe racism doesn't exist in Canada. Um, and when you do go to your union, like if you're in a position where you're not at the top of the heap in terms of your job or that stream for your job, you're ultimately asking your union to take your side against someone who's been in the union for 15, 20 years longer yeah. than you have, who brings in more, you know, and so it's not a, it's not a perfect system. And I know speaking for the Writers Guild, like if you are fired, it's, it, they can't do anything if a network is like, don't put um, BIPOC people on TV that's not their purview, right? If your contract is messed up, if you're not getting paid, if you're not getting paid your, your fringes, if you're being uh, discriminated against, if you're unceremoniously like dumped from your job, those are all actionable things for them specifically that they can, but no one's, they're not the arbiter of creative decisions from the, from the network. I think ultimately it, it, it does come down to who are the, who are the gatekeepers and what, what are their, what's their value system? And there, I don't, things are changing in terms of like the faces, but there are a lot of, you know, the old guard. And that's not to say that you can't make progress with those people in those, those same people in those same positions. But I do think it happens more slowly because I don't think that a lot of firmly entrenched people know that they're part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Are you sure about that? Like, I if you ask somebody who is not a person of color, if they would ever be a person of color and they say no, I'm pretty sure they have some idea of what it's like, what is being done to people of color. Like, I don't know. I think I don't know so, but I that. think a lot of those people think of themselves as part of the solution. They're like, I want to put diverse stories on TV. I want to, but but then turn around and say, you told a black story last week. This we don't want our audience to be like, oh, this is a black show now. And you're like, 
like you know what I mean that same person doesn't igno- yeah. doesn't know that that's fucked up and so yeah. if if you are on a show where the showrunner or the executive producer non-writing producers can say to the network executive we're absolutely not doing that that's not like think about it then that's different than your and there are people there are high level producers you know showrunners who will who will do that but mm-hmm. th- but not everybody will do that so in a system where not everyone who's at the top of the heap can be, uh, is vigilant or is part of the solution, there needs to be an other, there needs to be other avenues in place for reporting on this kind of stuff, you know, because like I said at the beginning, it seems that the only way we do make change is by everyone getting on Twitter and yelling. Yeah. And so that's fine if you're, if you're, Anthony and or you're you know someone who's already established and you're going to go out and say this is what I was asked to do this is what I was told I couldn't do and you're okay with all of the scrutiny <laughs> and I don't mean to speak for you Anthony no no I, I know I was it wasn't say, like that, I know that, it wasn't your favorite lot. thing that happened <laughs> no you know me you you don't mean to well I'm I, yeah I'm okay <laughs> but that's a position like and I'm I you know and I'm in a position where I can do that but there are so many people who aren't in a position yeah. to put them to go on twitter and risk their entire career you know by saying and i do think there is that there is the like i don't want to be part of a you know this show or this this production company or this anything that is behaving this way but there is something about staying in the fight too that i think is important because when you leave there will be in my experience, there will be a straight white guy who will take your place <laughs> They're awake. without any qualms about doing it. <laughs> so that's the other side of it too, is if you pack up and you go, fuck you, you don't deserve my talent, which is fair. There will always be a straight white guy who will take your place. You know, some of the stuff you're talking about too, just reminds me that like, I feel like there are too many self-proclaimed allies. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like mm. allyship is something that you should, you should earn from someone who's a member of that community. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like some people are like, I'm an ally. It's like, well, man, I'm not, we, we'll, we'll let you know if you, <laughs> if you are one. Because um, yeah. there's so many times we're just kind of like, people are saying these things and then their their actions are just different from their words. And I think that's one of the things that, that you know, I try to, I try to let people know. I was like, like, I was like, well, you say that, but these actions maybe you don't realize are the opposite of what you're saying. So each one, teach one. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, I do also think that there's value in saying that, like, even within marginalized communities, we have to be aware that we marginalize others, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's not as if, like, we are exempt now from the ways in which we discriminate within our own communities against others. So I think it's like, it is just this thing that we we have to be cognizant of as we move forward, of being like, how how am I doing my best to make and enable people to have roles in the industry and to help and elevate um, and how and and to be aware of the self as not just the oppressed, but also the ways in which we oppress others as well too, right? Like I think that that's something we all have to grapple with. Obviously, like the straight the straight white man at the top um, has like has to deal with that very in a very real way. Um, but I think we all do. I think we all do in our own way. So. And also, you know, I don't want to minimize that when I got like, I mean, it's, it's very rare for me to have a showrunner come to the show. It's like, yo, let me tell you some shit, right? Like, Anthony, you did a bit, you know, like, let's, <laughs> you, know, like, like you got an hour, let's, let, let's set aside some time, right? Like, it's like, you know, but um, so like, you know, have, speaking out is, is, is huge. But again, like, what, like, it's kind of depressing that we don't have an organization or a function that's empowered to do something on our behalf, like a union and someone at the, at the bottom said, what if we had a BIPOC union or in the comments, right? Um, uh, let me just acknowledge who said that. So I don't, uh, yeah. So, so Sasha MacArthur, should there be a BIPOC union? And I'm wondering if it's like, is that BIPOC TV and film? Is that like an organization we can empower to have some kind of official kind of uh, watchdog? Sorry, Natalie and Kate on for trying to pile on your tasks and duties and stuff. But like, <laughs> <laughs> like, is that like, I mean, is there like a group that we could like, or is there any other place that we can go? Or is that the kind of thing that this industry needs to have like a watchdog that we can, that can, uh, I don't know what, I don't know what the punishment would be. I would, I don't know where, I don't know how they, that would work. I mean, I think, I think also our industry is in transition to a certain degree, right? Because when you look at like the WGA, they have various subcommittees all of which deal with like specific marginalized communities and the WGC is like 
much smaller, has smaller resources. Um, so when situations like this occur, their tiny staff is now burdened with like all of this stuff coming at them. Um, I, I do think that it is this thing now of, of, you know, and I think BIPOC TV and film is doing important work because it is elevating and amplifying the voices that are not being listened to within the system. Um, but I do think the system itself needs to adapt and create room for these other marginalized voices. And whether that is subcommittees, whether that is the creation of safe spaces or hotlines or like any, like places where people who are experiencing discrimination can go and feel safe and report mm -hmm. um, is something that definitely has to happen within our industry for sure. And I think we're at a transition point right now where we're kind of seeing to Noelle's point, um, an old guard that perhaps views social activism as separate <laughs> a separate concern from just a general cultural shift um, and the importance of storytelling. Um, that old guard, I think, needs to um, to shift its views uh, and or leave and be replaced. So, yeah. well, I mean, I'm just trying to think. I mean, it's like because uh, right now, I feel like like when you guys were describing the unions. I feel like in the end, it is the union. I mean, it, it sounds to me like the union's job is to protect the industry and protect or protect the protect the existence of jobs here. All right. Like, and is that what's kind of like, like, I mean, so you, you're a committee within these unions at a certain point. Uh, I mean, like you're, you're still part like, you, you know, you're working within a union that has to protect jobs. I'm just trying to see, I'm trying to figure out what, what, what it is. Like, uh, you know, like it, it just reminds me of like the whisper network. Right. When we're talking about like pre me too, that's, that's, that's what it's at, at this point. Right. Are we in a transition period where we're going from this being, being a kind of a BIPOC whisper network towards something bigger? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Cause I'm, I'm trying to think how, cause I've heard people come to me and tell me a lot of things that I feel like, I feel like we need to discuss or just from the, from a writer's point of view, certain things like that, but honestly make me mad about what young writers have to deal with. And I'm trying to, in my brain, I'm kind of like, how do I, how can I address this without, <laughs> you know, there are so many people who are doing things and they have to sign NDAs. Like that's another thing that I want to talk about too, at some point, just like writers who sign these NDAs, like it's not the onus, you should only be signing an NDA to keep the, the actual like content, the actual like content secret, not the behavior. The behavior should never be part of the NDA. Like it's not up to me to, protect you from your bad behavior it's up to you to stop being bad so things like that like i think so many writers are just kind of like well i gotta sign it otherwise it's not gonna give me the job like they're just gonna give it to someone else that's that's some bullshit really like you, you shouldn't have to sign that sign your rights away so that you have to take abuse and just deal with it and yeah so stuff like that like just little things like that that kind of like boil me a little bit that we need to but i don't know I mean, I can like help individuals, but I don't know how to, I don't know how you do that as like a, mm -hmm. as a gigantic group. I mean, maybe it's just one of those things where we just kind of like have these discussions on a regular basis so people know, oh yeah, I probably shouldn't sign that NDA that's gonna allow them to do crap to me and I can't say anything about it. Can I ask, is that like a common thing on every production or is that like select, like, oh, okay. So it's like select productions that do that? Yeah, the ones who producers, who, I yeah, would producers say. who want to do bad shit to you, who right. <laughs> producers who want to the producers who want to put their names on your scripts without doing any work. Those producers, things like that. Right. Okay. And do they come to you with the NDA before they do that shit, or is yeah, it like absolutely. an after the fact kind of? It's one of those things. If you want the job, you sign this, and yeah. then and then you have to like you know just be okay with whatever happens. Like that's. Mm -hmm. That's that's bullshit, sir. That's, right. And then you like feel this. crazy yes. because you've been treated in such a way that is insane and you need desperately to talk about it and you can't. And I, it makes you feel insane. Like yeah. this town hall, I'm so grateful and, and Rad that you were able to like get us into this um, through the Now Magazine YouTube thing because I do think that having these conversations constantly will help because you feel powerless and you feel ashamed, like you should have done something, but you didn't know what to do. And none of, none of your allies 
allies came to your, you know, rescue to say anything or anyone in a position of power stepped up and said, this is not okay. And now you have this NDA that's going like, I can't even go out there and say, this is how this producer is treating or, you know, whoever is treating their writers, the kinds of things they're saying, the kinds of joke, hilarious jokes they're making. And so the more we have these kinds of town halls, I think the healthier we'll all be. Um, and the more like good ideas will be generated about how to how to move forward because I don't think like there's so much red tape when you deal with the with any guild or any union they're hamstrung on so much of this there will always be more potential for change working in this capacity that we are that's why BIPOC TV and film can change the industry because they're doing it on their own terms and they don't have to color within the lines of any other kind of organization they made their own rules and we're seeing the, the benefits and the results of that um well, i mean the again i just feel like giving bipoc tv and <laughs> all the work and all the job but it's like um i mean because I mean, at this point i'm seeing like i mean like let's say with this nda situation i imagine this is a thing that if you see an nda run but you're usually they usually probably give this to the people who have no experience and have no choice but to, is that the is that how i mean usually? Would they try to pass it yeah, off? I mean, I get them now. I get them now. Still, I just make sure I have a lawyer who goes through and is like, Anthony's not going to agree to this, and then sends it back, mm -hmm. and then they have to, if they want me on their show, then they have to address it. But I'm in a different situation than someone who's getting their first job, and it's kind of like, well, I got to sign this so I can, so I can get my first gig. That's a, it's it's that whole thing with like you no, know, the power shifts, right? Like so, it's kind of like when you first get an agent, you agent tells you what to do, and you're kind of like, okay, I'm just going to do what my agent says, and then you get to a place where you. You're telling your agent what you want to do because you've got enough, you've got enough, uh, you've got enough juice. Same thing with these production companies. You can tell them what to do once you get to a certain level, but until then, they're telling you what to do and they have the they have the power. And then you just kind of have to mm. hold on until you get enough power so you can get to the place where you're like, I'm not signing that NDA. I'm not signing that that thing. And then, but it's I must be really lucky then because I am, I would say I'm I'm pretty still emerging. But I still won't sign an NDA if I'm not liking it. I have an agent who asks me what I want to do as well. They don't tell me what to do. I mean, their job is to help me. Uh, and so I tell them what to do. Like, put me up for this or put me up for that. Do not put me up for this or do not put me up for that. I don't even want to hear anybody's white story from an Indigenous perspective. Like, don't even, like, don't even talk to me about that. Like, I don't know. Like, I guess maybe I just have a pretty unique voice and our clear picture of what I want for my future so but like I don't know and I, plus I create all my own work I don't jump in other people's rooms mm. I can I can vouch for the fact that you're very unique Ryan okay <laughs> <laughs> well thanks I, I know a lot of people <laughs> We just want to take you to every room, and he's like, "Here, tell our bosses to fuck off." Not, not, not my, not my <laughs> boss. I'm on no, not y'all. <laughs> but yeah. um, no, I but, love. Don't get me wrong. Like, I don't want to exclude anybody. I just want to include everybody, and that's like where I come from. And because I come from a very community-based perspective, being an Indigenous person from a res, and now I live in Toronto. Speaking of which, like my community was here before settlers came and we were pushed out into the place where we now live in Manitoba but now I'm back here and I feel like I'm home because my people are originally from here so that's pretty cool but like yeah I, I moved to Toronto because I think that there's you know a great a great industry here and I feel like it's growing and in, in in positive directions and I think BIPOC TV and film are helping speed like push that along for sure mm -hmm. but also people just gotta learn how to be like just don't take any shit I know that you say that you don't want to you know some people need to like pay for their rent and pay for their house and I totally agree with you because I'm I'm in that same boat too but I also feel like that we're in a place right now that we can fight for for everything that we want as creators um I mean that might not it might be harder at your level I'm sure you know working with like this straight white man but like also, I don't know, like, I feel like they know that a change is coming too. So why, like, I don't know. Yeah. Can I, uh, I just don't want to ignore um, 
some of the audience questions here because we got uh speaking of you moving from when uh, from manitoba to toronto ryan like we had someone who's a bipoc artist working in the prairies and they're like well how do i how do i make change happen over here don't tell me to move to toronto or vancouver is it possible mm. in the prairie? is like i mean you moved here is there is there any i mean wait is wyona Earp not shot down there yeah in manitoba room, the room's in toronto but it's shot in it's in alberta we shoot in right. Calgary. so you still have to be in toronto to make change and then you shoot it in Alberta like there's no hope for if you live in those prairie provinces that's just another country I don't know I think for Winona you have to be Emily Andrus to make change <laughs> <laughs> I, I, for, like personally like why I moved to Toronto is because like um it's not that I moved here for work I I was working on all seven shows that I have in development from various broadcasters in Manitoba but to get them in production on the other hand like Obviously, I think Manitoba is a great place. It has a 60, 65% tax incentive. Like, why wouldn't you want to shoot there? Um, I just moved here because I needed a change personally in my life. Mm-hmm. Um, I think what you people in Manitoba or the prairies need to do, like, I feel like I just, you know, was lucky enough to have written so many stories since I was 11. And I loved a lot of them. And and I just pitched them and it happened. Like, I don't think you need to be in any one place. Like we're in 2021. Uh, I think you could work from anywhere personally. Yeah. Well, okay. so I also got like some questions in the thing, like, I mean, uh, and I'll try and like wrap them into one question. Cause we're talking, like, there's a, there's people like a South Asian descent, what, like or different immigrant backgrounds. They're like, well, how do I, for one, what are the resources outside of, I guess, BIPOC TV and film that are available to newcomers um, in to crack into this industry, but also, uh, in terms of shaping content for this industry, I mean, I think at a certain point, there was this whole point where you had to shape your content, always considerate of those middle provinces, right? But now, now the streamers are here and stuff, right? So is, has that changed the way you could shape content now? Like, does that, or is, are people still all about, like, we have to consider that audience? And don't forget the first question too. I know I just wrapped two questions in no once. Can you, can you um, repeat the question? The first so one, okay, so yeah, two, I, I didn't realize as I was formulating my head how different those two questions were. But um, so the first one is like, what are the resources outside of BIPOC TV and film that like people can go to? Um, like, or is this, is this like it? And I, I know like, you know, there's other organizations collecting data and stuff, but like, mm. you know, in terms of like, you know, advice and, and mentorships and all that. ISO, the Indigenous Screen Office, I'm pretty sure that the Black Screen Office as well. Um, you know, there are local places in your community too that are doing, um, uh, like I would search out for all the, you know, filmmaking, like Winnipeg Film Group, you know, video pool, things like that. I'm pretty sure you can find resources there as well. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, like that's what I would say. Caribbean yeah. Tales is a lot of... A lot Inside of Out is great too. It's br- yeah. So that, and then the, the second part was like, is is the streamers making life better? Like, do you still have to cater to an audience that looks nothing like you? I I don't have an answer for that yet because Netflix ain't here yet, and Amazon's trying to figure stuff out. So, right. I mean, that's my mm. I don't so I don't. There are other people might might know, but I mean, I can tell you what the I've met them in the America, but I haven't met them in Canada yet. So, mm. I think it's still up in the air. Yeah. I don't know, but I don't know. I, Noel, JP, Ryan, have you guys talked to them yet? I'm waiting to see. I'm, yeah. I'm cautiously I, optimistic. So, but I mean, so what I'm hearing is right now you still have to consider those other areas. Yeah, I, I think so. I think, I mean, here's, I think Amazon still, when they're making, okay, I'll tell you this. When Amazon was looking for, Canadian, for content Canada, they said it had to be very Canadian, had mm-hmm. to be something that felt very Canadian because they wanted to, I think they're trying to find stuff that they can kind of like say, this is Amazon Canada, not just Amazon. And then it'll still go to the rest of the world, but it's a it's a Canadian story, something that only that can only be shot in Canada. Netflix oh. will probably be probably do something similar to that. Like I know they're they're making shows in a lot of different places around the world and they, they kind of try and feel as authentic as possible to that part of the world where they're shooting it. So it'll, it'll probably be that, but they you know they got to figure out who's running it over here first and well you know person well from my experience with netflix and the things that i pitched them like i pitched them uh you know a queer hockey story about a two-spirited hockey player and kind of like living in toxic masculinity and kind of like figuring out what two-spirited is and it's there right now and like 
I don't know what's going to happen with that, but the, you know, they love the idea and the pitch and, you know, now I'm just waiting to hear back from them. And I was a part of that big Canada pitch day thing. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a great pitch. Like I still haven't heard back from them though. It's been a couple months. So I don't know what's happening with that. We got to was that yeah. stuff too. Cause I feel like there's a thing that I got, I'm very cautious about because I was in the WG, I was in the, I was in the program for the programs for diversity for the WJ uh, Writers Guild and diversity and that whole thing. Like that's how I got on the office was through that program. And there was a big thing that a lot of writers who went through those programs back in the late noughties and early 2010s that were like, yeah, you did it. And then they were like, all right, PC later, we're gonna get someone else to be in the program now. You just kind of get shoved out and then there's no resources for you to get to the the mid-level section is kind of like get you kind of get had, I had to go back to the bottom to, to be a staff writer again after all that stuff so I, I get nervous when I see hey QT Baja people give us your ideas mm-hmm. and then we'll own them I always get like I get nervous when I read those things because I I just I, I hope it leads to actual like production and not just development uh, like I'm still waiting to see what's going on with the CBC Relief Fund thing. I know that they're really working hard on that. I know that they've got stuff that they're. they're I'm hoping that they take to actual series with stuff. But the, I, I got really kind of like, all right, do the right thing here because otherwise I just get. It's just more of that like you know, that's that trust. You either you're either building the trust or you're breaking the trust. And I I just hope that we're building it instead of breaking it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can agree. I can agree with that. Like. I didn't want to apply, but I'm like, the pitch was ready. I was like, whatever, you know? I mean, you have to, because you, yeah. you have to apply because if it works, like that's that's all we do. We throw stuff at the wall and hopefully, you know, hopefully things stick. So you can't not apply. You gotta, you gotta do it. But I just get, I get nervous when I see that stuff. Yeah. I would absolutely. watch nine seasons of two spirit hockey player tackling toxic masculinity. I would watch the <laughs> shit out of that show just to say, right. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate that. I'm very proud of that story. It, it's based on like a moment in my life. Um, also like everything that I do make and write, it's always from like either my indigenous perspective, my queer perspective or my identity or as a two spirited person. Um, because I feel like that's really important. Also, there are no two spirited stories on TV at all let alone, you know, an indigenous character on a recurring show. Except I feel like Corner, I feel like I've seen, um, who was it? Kaylee May? I Kylie? feel a few times. Uh, yes, I love her. She's amazing. Um, really and, you know, good on you for that, uh, for doing that. I think that's the own, I don't know, there's not much to, uh, uh, and there's a story actually that, um, I just want to give them a shout out. Is that cool with y'all? If I give somebody a shout out for their queer story. Um, Mary Galloway and Jesse Anthony have a show that's going to be premiering on Lumi soon at APTN. And it's the first, you know, story that I've seen that was a queer Indigenous story apart from Adam Garnett Jones's uh, Fire Song. And those are the only two examples that I have who are Indigenous people who tell two-spirited or Indigenous queer stories. So I'm excited about that. And I'm so fucking proud of them. Yeah. Um, Mary's, and, Mary's story is great. I've got, mm-hmm. I've, I've got a chance to read those scripts, a couple of those scripts, and they're excellent they're gonna blow the world apart i'm excited mm-hmm. me too i'm yeah, so yeah. excited <laughs> all right you know it's late um i don't know if anyone has any urgent party words but i think i'm gonna turn a good bring caden and uh, natalie back in on this um thank you all for letting me kind of uh i don't know macgyver a, a panel out of this shit situation <laughs> but uh and look 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 like the uh, caden doesn't even have a light on <laughs> <laughs> Leave me alone. Are you gonna get some parting <laughs> words with a little light? This is bullying. <laughs> <laughs> right. well, um, thank you all so much. That this was a really illuminating conversation, um, and I know we had a second part in terms of doing a town hall style where we would have taken some, um, open it up to the community and shared some of the anonymous experiences that were shared with us. But good news is that we're gonna do a part two of this session because I think it's an ongoing conversation that we're having. We really, really appreciate everybody sharing. Um, We will be announcing um, the dates for that very soon. So look out for email, social media, everything about it. I may just like walk down the street with a bell and (laughs) clink it so everybody can know what's going on. Um, But really looking forward to that. And I'm so grateful to everyone here. Thank you to Noel, JP, 
Natasha, who um, who unfortunately had to leave, um, Anthony, Ryan, um, and Rad. <laughs> thank you so much. And by extension, Now Magazine. Um, and thank you, Natalie, and also um, Ashutosh for you know, you, you did it tonight and so proud of you and so grateful to have you on the team. So thank you everyone for joining us. We'll send information soon about the part two. Thank you. Can and I also, also add a that? Thank I was you. Totally oh, oh. Sure. also a thank you to Christopher for doing the ASL and um, Joan and a lot of people behind the scenes who are scrambling around when uh, Zoom mm. let us down. <laughs> I just wanted to add, like, I was going to say, like, how none of this was, it was, this was going to be a safe space where I won't, I wasn't recording, I wasn't going to publish any of this material, you could say what you want, but then we published this on Now Magazine, so that, that was fucked up, <laughs> in any case. <laughs> Thank you all uh, for being here, so I'm going to, uh, we're good then, right? I'm going to sign us all out. <laughs> okay, peace. Thank you for everyone Thank for watching. You. Thank, Thank you. you.